Hello and welcome. Thanks to everyone for joining. Let us know where you're coming from in the chat. Send us a message. Hi, Rachel from NYC. Hi, Gina from Brantford, Connecticut. Hi, Kent from Mount Kisco. We've got Buffalo, Long Island, Lancaster, Rochester, oh, Virginia. Great, wow, Black Island, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Massachusetts, this is great. All right, we've got someone from Georgia watching today. Jim from Southington, Connecticut. Thanks to everyone for joining. My name is Sharon. I'm the communications manager for Audubon New York and Audubon Connecticut. I'd like to welcome you all today to an inside look at marsh birds and healthy wetlands. Our presenters today are Andy Kreinickel, the conservation biologist with Audubon New York and Kenneth Elkins, community conservation manager for Audubon Connecticut. We also have Scott Silver and Chris Lejeski here with us. Uh, respectively, they are the center directors for Constitution Marsh Audubon Center in Garrison and the Montezuma Audubon Center in Savannah, New York. Um, so they'll be answering your questions in the chat. Today, we are going to learn why healthy wetland ecosystems are critical for resident and migratory bird species. We're gonna learn the secret behind secretive marsh birds and other wetland wildlife, and uh, talk a little bit about how our on the ground work improves water quality and restores habitat. I know that your number one question is, will this webinar be recorded? And the answer is yes, it will be recorded. It will be immediately available to view on Facebook, and um, we will also follow up with an email recording after the fact. Um, questions are welcome at any time in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer them as we go. But at the very end, we're gonna open up the floor with Scott, Chris, Andy, and Ken for a Q&A. So after the official presentation is over, stick around and we'll be able to answer your questions in person. Uh, so with that, and with one more reminder that yes, this will be recorded and can be shared after the fact. I am going to hand the reins off to Andy Heinekel to begin the presentation. Thanks to everyone again for joining. Thanks, Sharon. Go to the next slide. So today's talk is gonna focus on freshwater wetlands and the birds that depend on them. Unfortunately, despite decades of progress in wetland conservation and the recovery of waterfall populations, we are still seeing a decline in a group of birds known as the secretive marsh birds. So Ken's gonna tell you a little bit about the birds. And after that, I'm gonna come back and tell you a little bit our, about our efforts to save them and the habitat they need. Ken? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to be with you this afternoon and share about some of our secretive marsh birds. And these are birds that are more often heard than seen. So today we're going to be sharing some of the sounds of those birds. They, many of them have very loud vocalizations and they may be unusual sounds that you've heard when you've been out paddling on a marsh before and just didn't know what that sound was. Many of them have cryptic patterns, so they're very camouflaged and they may be in sight and you're not aware that they're even there. And we're also going to share about how some of these birds are so well adapted for marsh life and how any changes in the marsh then impact their lives as well. So the first is that photo that you just saw was an American bitter. And here you need to uh, blur your eyes ever so slightly to notice that American bittern sitting right there in the center of the view, absolutely well camouflaged. And that is a uh, telltale uh, behavior of American bitterns. They're so great at camouflage that on breezy days, they're known to not only sit there with their necks up so their beaks look like part of the reeds, and all of those streaks on their chest look like individual shadows between those reeds, but they'll actually sway ever so lightly back and forth with the reeds 
Uh, and what's really funny is on a non-breezy day, when one of them starts to do that, it is kind of comical to watch them. Uh, so first of all, some of these birds are absolutely camouflaged and just not able to see them even when they're in view. The American bittern is also known for its very unusual vocalization. We're used to hearing other uh, heron-like birds with a big, deep cough-like sound or croaking sound. The bittern instead has been uh, represented as with nicknames like the thunder pumper because of its very pump-like sound. Quite the unique sound. More often we hear these marsh birds calling at night, but it isn't uh, out of the realm of possibility to have heard them during the day as well. Another extremely unusual vocalization from the marshes is the pied-billed grebe. rapid set of coups sometimes sounds like somebody laughing and uh, I've been leading groups on even smaller marshes in central Connecticut and on a beaver pond and the bird was somewhere in the middle of the marsh and we tried from different angles to get to see it but we definitely heard the bird all morning long during our walk. High-billed grebes are interesting a uh, study of secretive marsh birds. One of the things that they do really well is they build nests on floating mats of vegetation. Uh, so they're using the materials around them, usually lots of weeds. But the nests quite often aren't attached to the ground whatsoever and may move around, which is actually a great adaptation in case any of the water levels change. So this is one bird that despite the water levels changing in some marshes, this bird can still survive there pretty well. Also, pied-billed grebes have young that are semi-precocial. We're used to hearing about things like seeing turkeys and grouse that are precocial uh, young, that they are able to leave the nest uh, immediately. Most of our marsh birds, they leave the nest within about a day, but then they spend up to weeks following along behind their parents, learning how to feed on their own. Another bird that builds its nest on a mat in the marsh is the Virginia rail. And the rails, there's a group of them. Uh, to many people, they look like marsh chickens is one way of describing them. They, you can see the brown on their backs and the streaks there to camouflage with the reeds as best they can. Virginia rail is distinguishable with its bright red beak and its legs are even bright red too. You can see it in this photo here, but quite often they're covered in mud and we don't get to see that bright coloration of their, um, of their legs. Their sounds, rails sometimes have two different sounds. One, a, uh, a sound to attract another mate and maybe for other communication within a pair. Uh, sounds like the little phrase, kadik, 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 kadik. And when there is a confrontation between two pairs, Virginia rails tend to be very, very territorial over their section of the marsh. In other rails, you might hear the same thing. They have these grunt displays that they will call off to say, this is my section of the marsh, stay away. <laughs> And on a birdathon with some uh, Audubon volunteers this spring, we did hear that Virginia rail grunt quite often and then an echo in the distance on another section of the marsh. That location will actually be one of the places that I share later on today when we talk about where to go and find these birds. The king rail is an extremely secretive marsh bird and one that not only is it found on the marshes of the Great Lakes, which is where Andy is going to talk about how our bird, these birds I'm describing are leading us to Audubon's work, king rails can be found in a variety of other habitats, primarily freshwater and on occasion in brackish water where sometimes they do overlap with clapper rails, their cousin who prefers saltwater habitat. Today, the secret of marsh birds we're describing are all 
uh, prefer freshwater habitat, and a few like this king rail are in that exception that they can find their way in, and survive in brackish habitats when they cannot find a preferred freshwater habitat. The king rail's grunt is very similar to the Virginia rail. I've heard them a few times and got my hopes up that uh, I was hearing the other species, but they do have in their tick, tick, tick sound sounds a lot like a clapper rail, but they do have a unique vocalization as well. Kind of a tick and a little burr sound. Uh, if any of you are into hearing vocalizations of songbirds, then we all, many of you know a scarlet tanager in the forest says chick burr, and I always remember this is the scarlet tanager of the marshes is the king rail, that very similar call. They're a little taller than the Virginia rails, and I tend to like their coloration a little bit more. I love when I get to see one. Found in more of our smaller marshes in the northern part of the U.S. in particular is the Sora rail because it is a slightly smaller species. Notice that bright yellow beak stands out and they quite often have a black mask around that yellow beak. They're about 10 inches tall, maybe a foot, um, especially when uh, you're, they're standing out of the water, they look a little taller than you think they might be. And Sora's being in this rail group, they have two different types of vocalizations. Here's one. Curry, curry. Quite often they'll say it over and over again, and people think it's a frog sound coming from the marsh at dusk rather than the sound of a rail. And Virginia rails, and sorry, the soras can also be found in small little pockets during migration. Even a city pond with a great set of cover. This was found in Derby, Connecticut, in a very small little park uh, last spring, is this Sora rail. And they also have their own little grunt, but being so small and high-pitched, it doesn't sound as um, ominous as the other rail grunts. So those cute little pipping sounds can be a distinctive way of finding Sora. That if you happen to be looking at reports of bird watchers in other places, they might not have seen the Sora, but they reported that it was there because they heard that very distinctive whinny of a grunt call they had. Now on to some adaptations of surviving in a marsh habitat. One very well known for it is the common gallinule and their very long toes. We couldn't see any of the rail's feet very well, but they do have relatively long tails. The, the gallinules and moorhens even longer uh, toes so that they can balance on top of that emergent vegetation. Surprisingly, those long tails become great paddles and they may even swim across open water. As young, all, all of these rails and gallinules and moorhens, they all have a very fluffy black down. And when they're young, the only way we can be certain at identifying them right away is when they're near an adult. Uh, finding one on their own, it takes some other cues to identify them that they're all very similar, which is great for them that they hide and camouflage quite well in all of that shadows of the darker vegetation in a marsh habitat. And when found out in the open, this gallinule with that bright red shield and yellow tip to the beak is certainly a popular uh, bird when we do get to see them. Not only being able to walk across the vegetation, but climb in it is the least bitter. And there are many, many, many photos of this bird pulling splits, standing between the reeds. Uh, it is very well camouflaged. It lives a very secretive life. Uh, and it can be found in some of our marshes with a little bit more woody vegetation, where thing, birds like king rails really avoid it if there's any shrubs whatsoever. Uh, one of my best birding experiences was taking my daughter out to a marsh I was hoping to find least bittern, and there it was shoulder high in the shrub looking back at us. Uh, and we had walked past it and it was on the return trip that we were able to finally see it. Least bitterns have an interesting little cuckoo coo of a call, almost like a black cuckoo, black billed cuckoo. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
If you're lucky enough to get to see them out in the open, we can see that very orangey color with the streaks to be camouflaged on their chest, and very dark colors on top, so that way any predators flying overhead, they aren't able to notice them against the uh, dark background of the mud in that marsh habitat. We have a few other birds that lead us to our work in the Great Lakes, one of them being blue-winged teal. It is definitely one of the uh, most abundant waterfowl in North America, but because of the trends in its populations, and this in particular, uh, its sensitivity to changes in marsh habitat uh, that we found on the edge of the Great Lakes, it is one of our priority species in that area. And uh, for many people, it's another uh, crowd pleaser with that baby blue tuxedo color on those uh, coverts as it's in flight is the best way to get to see that. And we have one extremely social uh, marsh bird, not secretive, but instead out in the open is the black tern. We're used to seeing terns at the beach and they tend to all be white with a black cap. This is one of the few species with an all black body and dark gray wings and they nest in colonies. So our work is to help protect not just one nest or uh, habitat that might support just a couple pairs in one uh, habitat, but instead it could be up, it could be dozens of nests in one colony. During migration, sometimes they're in small groups, but also this species is known for being in larger groups than our other terns. And we do have a few songbirds, not just those bitterns and rails uh, as marsh birds that we're concerned with and that you can experience when you go to a marsh. The sparrows are an overlooked group of birds in my opinion. Little and brown, people feel that they're confusing to identify. I'll actually be leading a webinar in uh, October if you're interested on how to decipher and identify the different war, uh, sparrows coming through during fall migration. This is a swamp sparrow, rusty red cap, uh, nice little beige, rusty uh, wash on the sides. And compared to its cousins, it actually has longer legs which help it to be able to wade in the water better than uh, some of our other sparrows more known for living in grassland habitats. Their call is a little bell-like ringing. And the songster of the marsh, my favorite bird while out paddling by sound, happens to be the marsh wren with its little sound that I think sounds like an old sewing machine in my opinion. Marsh wrens are another species that can live in brackish water as well. Uh, by living a life very close to the water level, they definitely are sensitive to changes in water levels. And that's why the work that Andy and other uh, parts of our team at Audubon and our partners are working on to restore and protect habitats is critical in being able to manage what uh, is available for those birds. So at this point, I'm gonna pass it back over to Andy and share about our work at Audubon, how it's helping these marsh birds. Thanks, Ken. You need a new sewing machine, but I like that description of that bird. So as Ken alluded to, our freshwater wetland conservation efforts in the Northeast are nested under Audubon's water strategy and largely fall within the Great Lakes Basin um, and subsequently under Audubon's Great Lakes Initiative. New York, of course, borders a small portion of Lake Erie and a larger portion of Lake Ontario. You can see on this map the extent of the Great Lakes watershed outlined in blue. I believe it's like 700 miles of shoreline uh, within New York of the Great Lakes, which is more than what most people believe, what we think is there. Um, wetland, of course, is a broad term, and there are many types of wetland ranging from salt marshes to freshwater marshes, wet meadows, fen. Uh, marshes have a, provide a host of, of ecosystem services. The main focus of our on-the-ground conservation effort is freshwater coastal hemi marshes. So a hemi marsh, if you break that term in half, is exactly what it says. Half hemi marsh. So it's a 50-50 mix of emergent and submergent vegetation and pockets of open water. And hemi marshes benefit secretive marsh birds and other wildlife um, by providing an uh, optimum uh, mixture of cover uh, and forage that's important both for the breeding season and for migration as stopover habitat. Um, hemi marshes 
can and do exist outside of the Great Lakes coastal um, areas, of course. In fact, the photo here is Big Tupper Lake in the Adirondacks. Um, and later, Ken's going to tell you where these habitats exist um, in Connecticut and other parts of, of the Northeast. So in our little picture in the bottom of uh, left-hand corner there, the hemi marsh is the center circle in between shallow emergent marshes and deeper emergent marshes. So utilizing data from the Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program, our national science staff ranked wetlands at 100 meter resolution within 30 kilometers of the shoreline based on their importance to secretive marsh birds and others. The model's results guided our selection of 12 coastal wetland regions where we now work throughout the Great Lakes. Um, for more information on the science behind that prioritization, our national science staff just published a paper um, I think in conservation biology uh, regarding the science behind um, the modeling that went into this. And we'll put a link to that uh, in the chat section. The black dots on this map represent areas within the Great Lakes where we have active projects ongoing. And you can see two there uh, in New York, one in the Niagara River corridor uh, and one in the Braddock Bay area. So I wanna talk about those for a minute um, and give you a better sense of what we're working on. So the first two locations I want to take you to are great examples of a situation where one of our chapters, Buffalo Audubon Society, and our partners, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the New York State Park System and Ducks Unlimited have been working for some time and we've engaged to bring added value focused on our priority birds to the projects already in motion, while also providing additional coordination between partners working in close proximity to each other, but maybe on separate projects. Um, the work at these project sites that I'm going to talk about are all supported through a Sustain Our Great Lakes grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, in the Niagara River corridor, we are coordinating multiple projects at two general locations. And you can look at the top map there, um, and there's two blue dots. One of them is the northern dot there at Buckhorn State Park, and the southern dot is in the Niagara River itself. In the Niagara River, Buffalo Audubon Society is actually constructing a nesting island for the colony nesting common tern. Um, and we're gonna go in after that construction is complete and establish native emergent marshes in the shallow areas surrounding the island to further buffer the island and provide some of this forage habitat for our secretive marsh birds. So aside of just the common turd island, we're also providing that same native plant establishment at two other islands, Strawberry and Motor Island, who are managed by the New York State DEC. Um, so each one of the islands will receive native emergent marsh establishment in the shallow areas. Um, and you can see on the map on the left is a planting diagram of what that kind of looks like. The red and yellow areas are emergent and submergent plants. Um, they're gonna be established through a couple different method, um, plugs, but also, um, something called rock socks. And we contracted with Applied Ecological Services to establish the vegetation out in the Niagara River because they use a technique um, called rock socks. And I thought I'd bring it up on this talk because it's kind of neat. Um, the rock sock is there on the right hand side. Um, and what it is, um, it's basically a burlap bag um, with rocks inside or soil inside um, that weights the bag in the water. And these are grown out over the course of a season and then relocated to, the, you know, once they're healthy and well-rooted out into the shallows along these islands. The bags, of course, being biodegradable disappear over time, but they help anchor the plants in that high energy environment. Just sort of a neat way to get the plants to stay put and get, their, get, get them where we want them. So going north to Buckhorn State Park, this year at Buckhorn we coordinated pre and post construction vegetation and avian response monitoring for an emergent marsh restoration just completed by Ducks Unlimited at Burnt Ship Creek. Um, the photo you're looking at is Burnt Ship Creek before and after restoration. So you can see the cattail are kind of choking out Burnt Ship Creek, which is actually in the northern section of that photo. Um, and Ducks Unlimited came in and reconnected the back end of the marsh to the open water, um, providing uh, better hemi marsh habitat. Um, the monitoring of the site is so important. You wouldn't, 
have surgery without a follow-up with your physician, and neither should these marshes. So Audubon coming in um, and providing that monitoring allows us to inform our partners and our future work so that we know we're having the impact we desire. To the direct north of this site, um, we're working with New York State Parks and examining the health of the floodplain for us, which you can just see there in the top of the photo. Um, we're planning for planting of additional native tree species to maintain a healthy regenerating forest and a dynamic stopover habitat. That's really important to birds as they migrate through this area. So moving east to Rochester, New York, is a great example of Audubon bringing the right partners to the table to restore 191 acres of coastal hemi-marsh. The site is called Cranberry Pond, and it's a part of the Braddock Bay Wildlife Management Area managed by the New York State DEC. Cranberry Pond is a 260-acre cattail marsh that sits behind kind of a barrier peninsula that kind of shields it from Lake Ontario proper. The problem at the site has been cattail invasion into a once really diverse marsh. And you can say, well, cattail, what's the problem with that? Well, there's different kinds of cattail. There's a native cattail, broadleaf cattail, and there's a non-native invasive cattail, narrowleaf cattail, and multiple hybrids as well that become invasive. The narrowleaf cattail, once it gets into a marsh, tends to spread out, and eventually the marsh becomes nothing but narrowleaf cattail. And you lose the diversity both in the structure and in the species that our priority birds need. So working with the Genesee Valley Audubon Society, we approached New York DEC about restoring habitat for secretive marsh birds here. To address the lack of structure, we partnered with Ducks Unlimited again to restore the connectivity of the remaining hemi marsh, which you can see toward the back of the marsh there in the 1994 photo. And you can kind of see how that's kind of lost in tw by 2016. Um, so Ducks Unlimited is gonna come in and restore that connectivity through a creation of a series of shallow potholes and meandering channels that will link it back to Lake Ontario proper. But before we did that, we brought in a team from SUNY Brockport to identify and map any sensitive areas. Um, we didn't wanna go in there and end up damaging something that was more rare than the hemi marshes we were trying to restore. So the team at SUNY Brockport did in fact locate and identify a remnant fen uh, at Cranberry Pond. Fens are a rare habitat type in New York and are precious stopover habitat for many species beyond secretive marsh birds. So we were able to go back actually to NIFWIF and secure additional funds to allow SUNY to further study the fen, specifically looking for a method for controlling the invasive uh, encroaching cattail into the sensitive habitat type without damaging the fen itself. We can then use that information to inform all of our future restoration efforts, as well as share that info with partners that are working in similar habitats. And of course, once we knew what areas to avoid disturbing, we could then go in and map out areas that we could restore hemi marsh habitat through the creation of those potholes and channels that I mentioned. Um, so we're gonna connect those remnant open marsh areas back to the, to the front of the marsh. Um, and Ducks Unlimited, again, is gonna partner with us to complete that construction, and that's starting this winter. Um, Genesee Valley Audubon Society is conducting the pre and, the pre and post avian response monitoring to help inform us of the effectiveness of the restoration. And of course, none of this work is possible without public support, both the availability of grant funding and the existence of public policies that continue to conserve the places secretive marsh birds need are critical. Um, to that end, we have long been an active partner of the Howe Coalition, it stands for Healing Our Waters. It's a coalition of more than 145 NGOs um, and their mission is to secure a sustainable Great Lakes restoration plan and then the federal funding needed to implement it. Um, in fact, if you're passionate about wetland conservation, you should really consider joining us on one of our trips to Washington to tell policymakers why this matters to you. And of course, we walk the walk at our centers as well, and Ken's gonna get into this a little more, but the Montezuma Audubon Center near Savannah, New York is a great place to learn more about wetland conservation and even help us out by partnering as a marsh volunteer. Every year, the crew at the MAC and the Friends of Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge um, engage in army of volunteers um, in activities that range from invasive species control to native seed collection. 
Um, and MARSH stands for Montezuma Alliance for the Restoration of Species and Habitats. Um, and it's a great way to, to join with folks that are like-minded and want to work on habitat um, improvement projects. Um, and you can find out more about the MAC and how you can get involved. We'll put a link again in the chat section. Another way you can support wetland conservation is to purchase a federal duck stamp. These can be found at most post offices, Fish and Wildlife Service offices, and many places that sell hunting and fishing licenses. The funds from duck stamps are used to conserve wetland habitat within the National Wildlife Refuge System. Here's mine. Uh, every year a new artist gets to create the, the waterfowl uh, that goes on the, on the stamp itself. Um, they're great and they're quite collect collectible. So Ken, I think, is going to tell you about some additional places uh, where you can find examples of wetland habitat. Ken? Thanks, Andy. It's exciting to see all the work that my colleagues are doing. Uh, not all of our communities are connected directly to the Great Lakes, and uh, so we can't visit those habitats that Andy was just describing, but we can still experience the marsh birds and see some other local work that's being done in different areas. The Constitution Marsh Center is uh, just south of Cold Spring, New York, and Garrison, New York. It's on the eastern uh, habitat of the Hudson River. And there we have an Audubon Center where there is a trail out to this boardwalk where you can get to see part of the marsh habitat. And there we do have projects going on for invasive removal and for monitoring habitat as well. It's, um, so there, it's, our work is beyond this Great Lakes work. So the point we're trying to make here. And in Connecticut, we have a restoration project for a marsh at the mouth of the Housatonic River, which happens to be brackish water. It's the Audubon Center Stratford Point, which is a habitat project in partnership with Sacred Heart University. And there it's a great stopover habitat to get to experience these birds. We're recreating a habitat. It's a living shoreline, which is a demonstration for coastal resiliency as well. And in Connecticut, uh, I wanted to point out, and these are great examples for uh, everyone else, if, wherever you might live, that there are some other great habitats that there's access for people to get to enjoy marsh birds. And in Connecticut, I've led groups to Station 43 in South Windsor is a sanctuary operated by the Independent Hartford Audubon Society. The White Memorial Foundation in Litchfield has a lot of forests, but also some great boardwalks through their marshes. Cromwell Meadows in Cromwell might not be uh, as accessible with great uh, trails, but it is an amazing habitat for marsh birds. And the Eight Mile River, there's a mixture of different uh, freshwater tidal wetlands can be a great spot there near the mouth of the Connecticut River and the Eight Mile River itself has many designations uh, for its scenic value and as a last wilderness area within the state of Connecticut. And finally, Wemysink Marsh in Sherman has magically come on the birding map over the past five years or so after Audubon and a few other partners helped with being able to uh, protect more of this marsh and increase access with a simple boardwalk to the area. And it is now a wonderful habitat where we're seeing many of those marsh, secretive marsh birds I described earlier. Uh, but it's great that we were able to work with partners and provide ways that uh, some of the money actually came as mitigation, that there was other construction projects and they paid into a program with the Army Corps of Engineers and Audubon gets to have a voice in making sure that that money is protecting wetlands that help our marsh birds as well. We could discuss where to go birding for days. I love this topic, but I wanted to make sure we ended in timely fashion so we can take questions. So Sharon, pass it back to you. Thanks, Ken, and thanks to all of our presenters. Um, for those who may have joined after my initial welcome, uh, this is my moment to remind you that we are about to move into Q&A, so you can put any questions that you have into the chat. 
Um, we are going to be rejoined by Ken, by Andy, and also by Scott Silver, who is the uh, director at the uh, Constitution Marsh Audubon Center and Sanctuary, as well as Chris Lajeski, the center director at the Montezuma Audubon Center. So put your questions into the chat. That's where, we're, where we'll see them. Or if you're joining us on Facebook, you can type your question into a comment box. Um, this webinar is being recorded just as a reminder, so we will be able to share it with you after and it will be immediately available on Facebook. Um, and now we're going to move into the Q&A, so I invite everyone to come back on screen and I've got some great questions for you. Um, so the first question is very timely to the moment that we're in now from Dina. Are the mentioned marsh birds migrating now and where do most go? And any one of you can just <laughs> raise your hand or unmute yourself to answer. Yes. Chris, go ahead. So, uh, thank you, Sharon, uh, and thank you all for joining us today here at the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. We are enjoying a considerable number of migratory birds, especially those secretive marsh birds. Uh, we've got pied bill grebe, common gallon yule, American coot, the bitterns, all coming through right now. Uh, they truly are secretive this time of year, very quiet. Uh, so you really need to use your eagle eyes to find them. They're not as vocal as they were back in the spring, but certainly now is a great time to be out in the marshes looking for migratory birds. Oh, and where are they going? Well, some of these birds are gonna go as far south um, gosh, as the Southeast United States, some may uh, uh, venture down towards Central or South America, but, but most are going to stay up here in, in the U.S. Wing teal is one migrating already. Earlier, we think of duck migration happening more in November here in the Northeast. And some of, one of the reasons why they're migrating early is some of them are going all the way to South America. So some have an even longer ride ahead of them. And can we talk a little bit about their diets and um, what they eat? Sure, uh, many of them are finding invertebrates in the water around them. So whether it's uh, larva and nymphs of some of our insects, it can be crayfish if they're in brackish in, in freshwater and some of them are eating even small snails and other small crustaceans wherever they can find them the primary sources. Somebody might know others too. That's, uh, I was just going to add to that, that that's one of the reasons that enhancing the hemi marsh habitat benefits these birds, because not only does it provide cover for them, but it provides habitat for the entire food chain and those invertebrates that they're consuming. So the more invertebrates that are present through a more diverse marsh, the more food there is for these species. And sometimes the birds will eat uh, vegetation as well, either the seeds or the uh, fruit that are produced by the native plants in these marshes. Great, thank you. Next question. Can the marsh birds do as well with invasive plants like Phragmites as they do with native wetland vegetation? I feel like all of you want to answer this one. So Andy, you can go first, maybe Scott, Chris, everyone can chime in. Yeah, so the answer is, is, a, is a little bit complex and, and the, the, the short-term answer is for a time, for, for a short period of time, eventually invasive plants will overtake the, the habitat structure of the marsh, meaning how many open patches there are, how many gaps there are between the vegetation. And if you've ever seen a, a marsh dominated by Phragmites australis or giant reed grass, you'll see what I mean. It becomes nothing but that and it loses the structure that these birds are looking for to make nests, to have the room to forage, to be able to come out and, and peek at you and call to their mates. Um, so when an invasive comes into the marsh, it initially doesn't impact them as much as it does once it takes over the habitat. Scott, go ahead. You'll have to unmute yourself. 
That's, I, was, I, I already typed a, a similar answer, but um, if you ever look at, at a, a stand of cattails and a stand of Phragmites, you'll notice that within the cattails, there's all sorts of other marsh plants that are, that are able to survive in there. And that increased diversity increases the complexity, makes more habitat available for more species, as well as more birds from any particular species. Um, so I, I'm really just um, reinforcing what, what Andy was saying, but um, absolutely because of the um, Pragmites in particular um, dominates so much, it doesn't allow for the diversity that promotes abundance of wildlife, not just birds. It's also much less edible. There's, muskrats aren't consuming it and opening up patches. It has less of a value for, for food. All right, great. Next question is, um, are the swallows that gather in marshlands considered marsh birds? I would say they are when they're in the marsh. Uh, they're definitely utilizing that habitat type and showing us that that habitat is valuable to them. A lot of birds use marsh habitat, even though they're not marsh birds. So I wouldn't consider necessarily a swallow to be a marsh bird, although some swallows frequent areas adjacent to marshes. However, during migration, a lot of species use those marshes, particularly in the Great Lakes, because as they prepare to cross the Great Lakes, which is a great expenditure of energy, they need to sit, hunker down in those marshes for a bit, catch their breath and refuel for that flight across the lake. And then when they get to the other side, they, they take a rest in those coastal marshes and that stopover habitat as well. Thank you. I'll just use this moment to remind everyone, we're not just taking questions here in Zoom, we're taking questions on Facebook as well. So if you're out there watching on Facebook, you can type your question into us. Um, that said, Lara from Facebook would like to know, uh, is it possible to tell the difference between real species using sound? Ken, maybe you want to take this one? The sound may be some of the uh, easiest ways to distinguish them because getting to see the whole bird not obscured by the vegetation as it's walking around can sometimes be more difficult. Uh, that each of the closest would be the grunt of Virginia rail and king rail might get overlapped for some people. And then the ticking call of clapper rail and king rail can be similar. Otherwise, I think they're pretty distinctive from each other. Yeah, I was going to add that most of the time when I'm in the marsh, I'm hearing the birds more than I'm seeing them. So oftentimes that's what we use to identify them. Okay, great. So next question. When visiting Montezuma, I've seen a lot of digging. Is this done to help the marsh birds? That's a great question. And, and maybe the larger question is also what might folks see us doing visibly on the ground uh, in order to create more resilient habitats? So Chris, you can start us off. Thank you for that question. The Montezuma wetlands complex is a huge area with multiple partners. And I think uh, the question is referring to uh, some activities down at the National Wildlife Refuge uh, along the Wildlife Drive, where over the last several years, the biologists down there have been restoring that uh, marsh because it was just inundated with cattails, largely the invasive cattails. So the biologists went in with heavy equipment, excavated out a lot of that area, made some large uh, potholes. And now that is utilized, but certainly by these secretive marsh birds, but we're also noticing the waterfowl, ducks, geese, and swans using that habitat as well. Scott, what might we see going on at Constitution Marsh? And um, by the way, that is in Garrison in New York. Sorry, I was, I, was answering a, um, I was answering a question. I was typing an answer, so I didn't hear the question. Um, what, if people are visiting, what sort of management activities might they be seeing happening? Well, there, there's a couple of different things. Um, in this weather, we're doing, um, we're, we're doing um, surface elevation studies. Um, where we're, we're looking to see what the what the um, effect, the potential is for the marsh to adjust to um, a change in the water levels 
Um, so we actually we actually have we've um, drilled down to 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 the bedrock, and we're getting some idea of what the vegetation levels are, what the what the sedimentation rates are, and um, how much free water we have over the course of years. We've been doing this for about five years, and um, every year we we actually measure 99 different points. I've just learned that recently. Um, to get some idea of how the marsh itself is going to, is uh, adapting to changing uh, water level, sea level rise. You know, it, it speaks to the importance of outreach like this, though, because people do drive around and see work happening, and without understanding what's happening, why there's an excavator in the marsh at Montezuma, for example, um, there could be a lot of concern that's undue. Um, You know, one of the things that you might see also in Constitution Marsh, um, though we're not we're not doing any any more for the rest of this year, is um, we use and people have been asking questions about how to control some of the Phragmites. One of the things we do at Constitution Marsh um, to remove Phragmites and just have it be uh, um, native cattails is we use a what we call a geotextile. We use a, a textile that we actually cover large stands. What we do is we press down stands of Phragmites flat and then we cover it with this textile and we let it actually a, a dark textile so that it heats up over the course of the year. We leave it on for two seasons actually um, and it kills off the the Phragmites um, because just cutting Phragmites is an ineffective way and and if you can avoid uh, herbicide uh, applications of course you want to do that. Um, so this is a non-herbicidal control. Um, you leave it on for a couple of years and when you take it off um, the cattails are much uh, grow back much more effectively in that in those areas once you've killed off the the Phragmites. And um, at currently, we only have, you know, all 280 acres. We only have about three acres of Phragmites left in the marsh. So it's been a very effective technique. You have to work hard to find Phragmites, and um, everything else is cattails, which is pretty much the opposite of almost any other wetland uh, in the area. Ken, you showed us a great map of locations to see marsh birds in New York and Andy. We got a great view of the work going on in the Great Lakes. Um, for folks who live all across Connecticut, New York, and other states, um, what makes for a good marsh habitat to, to see birds? You know, if people are, are just wondering where they can go locally, um, what should they look out for? I think Andy's description was great earlier that finding a wetland that has a mix of open water with a lot of emergent vegetation, whether it be cattails and uh, lilies and uh, especially pickerel weeds is one where I seem to find a lot more of the smaller rails myself. Um, that's the picture you're looking for is somewhere where there's a mix of open water and then not just straight grass all the way or all Phragmites. You'll find some, but not as rich of a diversity. And I would, I would add to that, that the size of the area is, is somewhat important. Um, these birds are impacted by disturbances. So the larger the contiguous section of habitat is, um, the more these birds can exist happily in the interior of that patch uh, away from disturbances. So find larger patches. Um, and if I could, share, I see another question here that kind of touches on this, and it's from Dean, and it says, will these marsh birds use a mini pond in a suburban woodland habitat, um, like in our yards, as stopover habitat? And so the other component of looking for places where you're going to find these birds is looking at the landscape overall. If you have a small component piece of habitat within a larger block of land of a dissimilar habitat type, you're less likely to find the birds that specialize on this particular habitat type. So if you're surrounded by upland forest, but you have a small wetland area, there might be some birds there, um, but it's not necessarily going to be full year-round breeding habitat for them. As far as stopover, they might be there from time to time just because there's nothing else in the landscape. Um, but you definitely want to have as much contiguous habitat as possible. Thanks, Andy. Um, what area of study supports a career such as any of our panelists? I'm sure that question is not directed towards me, but I was an English major. 
Um, Andy, do you want to give us your background? We can go around. Andy, Ken, Chris, Scott. Sure. Sure. So my academic background was in biology, wildlife biology, and then ecosystem studies. So um, take as many courses as you could possibly find that have anything to do with those subject matters. And then when you're done taking academic courses on those subject matters, go out and volunteer and get your hands dirty and do this stuff as much as you can with anybody that'll have you. Um, and that's where you get the real world experience. Yes, finding coursework that has field components as much as possible. That's what I chose out of the course record was every single one with an outdoor lab uh, for a degree in environmental and forest biology. And for the education side was the concept of environmental interpretation was my other set of courses. So Chris, you wanna go first? Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, sure, so my degree is in geology. Uh, so not the typical uh, Audubon employee, but I've got that science background, that passion for uh, birds and conservation now kind of came later in life for me. Uh, but I had that, that background, that knowledge about the, the natural world. And soon after getting that geology uh, uh, job right out of college, I discovered that uh, preserving our habitats is how I wanted to go with my career. So volunteering, as Andy said, was key for me to take that left-hand turn with my career and find that new path that led me to nature centers, environmental education, birds, and conservation. Uh, and so fortunately here in upstate New York, we've got multiple opportunities for folks to volunteer, both here at the Montezuma Audubon Center, but also out in Syracuse through our Onondaga Lake Conservation Corps program. So similar, sort of similar to Chris, I, um, my, my background is really, I almost hate to say it, but uh, uh, mammalogy. I'm a, I'm a mammalogist more than an ornithologist. Um, but I think the important thing is to become um, an ecologist and um, learn, be a trained scientist. And then all questions are read the same way and answered through the same way. And it doesn't really matter what your, your, field of expertise is because you can read. Just like, just like when you learn to read a book, um, there's all information is available to you. So I think the important thing is to be, to be well versed in the scientific method and, and um, to, to have as much exposure to ecology as possible. And then it doesn't really matter. You know, I've been, a lot of times so I've had many people ask me, you know, what's the major I want to have? And the major doesn't really matter that much. You can be an ecology major, you can be a biology major. You can be um, um, uh, an animal physiologist and be involved in the things you want to be. Those are just those are just labels, categories that we put things into. But it's an understanding of the life science and, in this case, ecology that allows you to do pursue whatever it is that you really find interesting. And then you can be an English major and put on webinars with scientists. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so, uh, oh, I missed, where did my question go? Give me one second. Ah, are you conducting vegetation surveys as well as the pre and post bird monitoring on these restoration sites? And what are the challenges involved with that? This is clearly someone who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> oh, good question. Yes, yes, we are conducting vegetation surveys. Um, it's important to understand how the vegetation is responding because that's what we're altering to, to modify the habitat. Um, some of the challenges associated with that, particularly on Lake Ontario over the last couple of years, as many of you know, we've had record high water levels across the Great Lakes. And um, instead of waders, there's been days where we need scuba gear to go out there and monitor things. So Getting out into the marsh physically, especially with volunteers, can be a challenge when water levels are, are high. Um, I'll leave it at that. We have a Jeopardy question here, which is, what is the biggest bird ever? <laughs> but I'll let you think about that for a second. Um, and uh, we have another, um, 
another viewer wondering, um, how do we tell the difference between cattail species and, uh, and other invasives that might look like native plants? Yeah, that's a great question. And it takes a long time to be able to discern them by eye upon first glance. In general, the differences between native cattail and non-native cattail, and I think Chris may have touched on it, are just the size of the leaf. Uh, broadleaf cattail is a much larger, flatter leaf. Narrow leaf cattail obviously has a narrower leaf. There's also a difference in the distance between the catkin on top of the cattail, the little puff of seeds, um, and the, the rest of the stem. Um, there's some other small differences. Oftentimes when you're looking at the differences between some of these closely related plants, it helps to have a field guide um, with you. And I still carry one every time I go out there because it never fails. There's something out there that looks like something else close enough where you need a book. Thanks, Andy. Um, well, I think that is all for the questions that we can take on today's webinar. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining. We will be sending out a follow-up email um, in the next couple of days with a recording of the webinar. And um, if you have any questions, you can follow up with us uh, when we send out that email. Um, if you have any questions as follow-ups for any of our presenters, our email addresses are just our first name dot our last name at audubon.org. Um, Ken, if you happen to have that slide available with the Connecticut and New York email addresses, we'll put that back up on the screen. You can email us and we're happy to get back to you. Uh, do any of you have anything that you'd like to say before we officially close out? Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Great. Good birding. Uh, Enjoy the migration, everybody. Yes, thanks to everyone for joining. This will be recorded. It will be sent out after the fact. And we look forward to seeing you on next month's webinar. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>